Hi there, uh, my name is Douglas Mokimura. I'm a gastroenterologist affiliated with uh, University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. And I'm um, very happy to be here with my co-author virtually, Dr. Robert Bashira, who is affiliated with Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. Uh, Dr. Bashira uh, completed his advanced endoscopy at St. Michael's Hospital and then um, did a one-year fellowship at uh, Showa University, Toyosu, Tokyo, Japan, where he learned poem and other third space techniques. Uh, myself, I completed my advanced endoscopy training in Vancouver and then also spent a year in Japan at Kobe University, focusing primarily on ESD. And so together, uh, we were hoping to present our recently accepted paper entitled uh, Complete Circumferential ESD for Early Barrett's Neoplasia. So to get things started, I think I'll cut right to Dr. Bashara and ask him, um, Rob, how did you conceive of this series? Like, how did this come to mind? So it really began by seeing patients that had multifocal dysplasia or carcinoma and thinking, what's the best strategy to treat these patients to avoid unnecessary surgery? Uh, and I thought that complete circumferential ESD would be the ideal treatment for these patients, uh, with the major consideration being stri stricture prophylaxis. So during my, my time in Japan, um, I did see circumferential ESD, although it was performed for multifocal squamous cell carcinoma. And the stricture prophylaxis regimen there consisted of systemic steroids uh, and at times uh, local injection. So I thought, why not uh, try a multimodal approach uh, in terms of a stricture prophylaxis, which may include systemic steroids, topical steroids, as well as local uh, injection of steroid to minimize the risk of stricture in these patients that would otherwise have a stricture rate of 100%. Thanks, Rob. And uh, so in essence, this was a retrospective uh, series uh, where we accrued all the patients who underwent circumferential ESD uh, for Barrett's related lesions at our center over the span of about seven years. Uh, and because of the radical nature of the procedures, it was pretty rare. Uh, we only had 11 cases um, of this kind of resection. Uh, we decided to only include Barrett's related neoplasia for a couple of reasons. One, that's mostly what we're seeing here in North America. And two, there is already some data from Japan about circumferential resections for squamous cell uh, carcinoma of the esophagus. So we decided just to, for the homogeneity, just to include the, uh, the Barrett's uh, population. And so before we get into the methods and results any further, I'd like to cut to Dr. Bashir and ask him how he actually does these resections uh, and what his general strategy is. So uh, I've tried various uh, techniques and methods for the circumferential ESD, um, but I found the, the easiest and most reproducible uh, is using the three tunnel method. Um, so in this technique, uh, the first step is doing a circumferential incision uh, on the gastric side uh, and then trimming it and making sure you get down to the muscularis propria. And then when I come back to the proximal end, I basically perform three tunnels. And I think of it as an equilateral triangle and each point uh, is a tunnel. So I do three tunnels, and then when all the tunnels are complete, I'll start expanding each tunnel laterally, and then eventually all the tunnels meet and the lesion's completely dissected and is only connected by the proximal epithelium. And then at the very end, I'll basically incise the remaining epithelium and any small amount of remaining submucosa, um, and then the, the lesion is released. So I found this technique to be overall the easiest uh, most reliable and reproducible and fastest. And so uh, flipping through these tables, Rob, in your view, what do you think was the most important or most, most pertinent finding uh, in this paper? So some of the most important findings from my perspective are that overall this procedure was safe and effective with a high R0 and on-block resection rate without any perforations. And that should the pathology have high risk features, these patients could still go on and receive additional treatment as required. Uh, in addition, uh, the patients that had the um, prednisone and topical steroid initiated uh, and maintained on it uh, starting 48 to 72 hours after their ESD, none of them developed refractory strictures, uh, and some of them even didn't require any dilations. So I know we're probably running a little bit long here, but I think one of the questions that will come up is about other techniques for these kind of widespread and multifocal lesions. One of the ones that was recently published on was um, the so-called stepwise ESD technique. Uh, and I was hoping you could comment a little bit on that, Rob, and maybe talk about um, if you can foresee these two procedures, circumferential and stepwise, uh, coexisting and, and how. So I definitely do think these techniques can coexist. Uh, the stepwise ESD, however, is um, a bit more restrictive in the lesions that you can perform it on. 
because you have to ensure that you're doing it on lesions where you can avoid uh, cutting through neoplastic epithelium, which is not always possible. The other challenging uh, aspect is uh, the subsequent ESD when you're doing a stepwise uh, approach. The second ESD is generally very difficult uh, because you have to cut through uh, scar and fibrosis because generally you want to include some squamous mucosa on the lateral margins to ensure that you have an R0 resection. Uh, and that area ends up being the area of the prior ESD. So it's quite scarred and fibrotic uh, and can be quite challenging. Um, but I do think that these definitely are both options in select patients. Uh, it's just another option depending on the patient's uh, lesion uh, and anatomy. And in patients uh, where the stepwise ESD is possible, uh, when you present to the patient the possibility of having two stepwise ESDs or a circumferential ESD with obviously the risk of uh, higher risk of stricturing, I generally find that most patients uh, prefer to have the complete circumferential ESD from the beginning and just have everything removed uh, in one time uh, and deal with the subsequent issue of stricturing as it evolves. Thank you very much. And that's true that the stepwise procedures that I've seen a couple have been uh, quite challenging uh, because of the fibrosis, as you mentioned. And so just to cap things off, uh, uh, Rob, where do you think that uh, things will go next after this series and what might you want to investigate uh, kind of as a next step? So I think in the short term, it would be to accumulate more data uh, on these types of resections and lesions um, and also optimizing the stricture prophylaxis cocktail that we currently use. Uh, in terms of duration, dose, uh, and time of initiation. However, um, the big dream really would be a novel technique or treatment uh, for stricture prophylaxis that is highly effective with little uh, or no risk to the patient. Uh, this would really change the paradigm for Barrett's neoplasia treatment uh, because patients would be able to have their uh, dysplasia, carcinoma, and the remaining Barrett's all treated in a single session without the need for further uh, ablation uh, or dilation or EMR or anything else uh, subsequently. So that would really be, um, that would really be something um, amazing. Okay. And I think that's it for us. So thank you so much for um, uh, taking the time to listen to our author interview. And uh, I hope you enjoy the paper. Thank you very much to the GIE for the opportunity to do this.